very warm welcome to our, our monthly luncheon meeting. And today we're very honored to have our very good friend Robert Steele with us. Robert is the founder and director MEB, of uh, Sustainability Asia. He's been in, in the region for, I think, more than 20 years, right, Robert? 15, 15 years in Thailand and um, in Indonesia a lot. He travels all the time. He's a very busy man, so I'm very glad to have been able to, to schedule this. And um, today he'll be talking to us about how to lead organizations and people uh, uh, into change for sustainability. And that applies to both business and, and any organization. Um, Robert has worked with uh, various governments, NGOs, international agencies, and many um, uh, companies in the Asia Pacific uh, region to enable the successful integration of sustainability into their systems. He is a senior associate with the Atkinson Group, who we have partnership with, and also a faculty member of the ISIS Academy, which will be partnering with us in January to run a very intensive five-day master class workshop um, for leading change for sustainability. So Robert will be giving you a very good overview of what that's all about, like why sustainability, why change, why leading, why innovation, all these things. So uh, without fur further ado, I'd like to welcome Robert. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is, you can hear fine with this. All right, so um, I just came from Indonesia you know, yesterday. <laughs> Because uh, as I said, I've been working there for now about 15 months on, uh, with the ADB on developing an uh, action plan for education to address uh, education for sustainable development and also environmental education. But also, I work um, quite a bit in the last seven years working with communities and universities and companies how to implement organizational sustainability, system, changing systems, embedding sustainability into business functions, uh, into values, into their vision, and developing indicators as well, indicator systems for reporting and communicating. How many of the people here work directly in sustainability or CSR? And the rest of you? Somewhat on the fringes. Yeah. Marketing yeah. and traveling. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a lot of cross, uh, how do you say, cross pollinization between departments now dealing yeah, with CSR right. and sustainability, which is what we want, right? We want collaboration. And I'll speak about that because it has been, I think, historically, especially when CSR is sustainability pops up on the screen of companies, it goes to the PR or the Corpcom department, and that's where it initiates sometimes marketing, HR. Um, depends how they, they view it. But more and more, we're seeing uh, much more cross-functional type of teams being built in organizations, and that's really what I want to talk about, is how, especially as a, a young, maybe middle manager, not the top executive, but someone within the hierarchy that has some influence but not really can be the decision maker to say, oh, like, our company, we're going to do this. Okay, so how do we lead change? How do we get our companies to start embracing, you know, the governance transformation that's needed, the change in products and services to align with sustainability as, you know, middle managers or our leaders. So before I go too much further, just uh, to set the context, context of this talk, when I use sustainability, I like to keep it quite simple, but also broad. And in a systems sense, and as perhaps you introduced my, I don't know if you read closely the name of my company, it's not sustainability, it's sustainability. Because I firmly believe that systems thinking is really at the, one of the core of this transformation to, to sustainability. Okay, not seeing things as linear, but seeing things as interconnected, dependent, and cyclical. Okay, but basically, sustainability and 
context that I want to use here is a set of conditions and trends that can, in a given system that can continue indefinitely, okay, to sustain. And sustainable development basically is a strategic or a managed process of continuous innovation in the direction of towards system change in the direction of sustainability, trying to maintain a sustainable system condition. That's basically what we're trying to do. At any one point of space in our time and space, we can be sustainable. But we have to also keep in mind the long term. Right? That's where we fail oftentimes. This is our big challenge. Because it, the world seems quite still okay, but I think there are some alarm bells going off. If you look at the leading global indicators, there's a lot of similarity in them. What is that? What is, how would you describe the similarity that you find? And what you're seeing is things like uh, water use, global uh, GDP, um, international tourism, I think is up there. Uh, amount of uh, domesticated land, global biodiversity, Loss, I believe, coastal zone. Uh, not sure what this is. Biogeochemistry. This one's flooding. Anyway, what is similar about all of those? Going up. Going up very rapidly, right? Exponentially. <laughs> okay. So our world is just really changing fast, especially in the last 100 years. Actually, how do you, from 2 billion people at the turn of the, of the 20th century to now 7 billion. And that's just one indicator, of, and it's the leading indicator for all of these because human population is consuming, right? And this is our dilemma because things are changing so fast, it's a bit hard for us to kind of fathom what is going to happen next and to absorb these changes. But science is now catching up and telling us that we are beyond the limits. A lot of key system indicators, global indicators that will have profound effects. This is a, a, a schematic showing research on what was called the planetary boundaries. It was a team of 29 global scientists um, trying to quantify what is the safe operating space for humanity? And they came up with nine indicators. And the green zone is a safe zone. That's the safe operating space. So they've already shown that three of the indicators, climate change, uh, biodiversity loss, and uh, I believe uh, fresh water. Or, no, it's, uh, it's the nitrogen cycle. Or way over. So these are indicators saying that there's a sense of urgency here. But many of our communities, our government systems, our companies are similar to what we call the boil frog. Are people familiar with this analogy? So uh, basically, research shows, I don't uh, recommend you do this at home, but if you take a frog, a live frog, you put them in a saucepan at room temperature, Turn up the heat, maybe medium, medium high. Slowly the water will change, right? It's hotter and hotter, gradually. So the frog will not jump out immediately. Still comfortable. But the frog sense that things are changing, becoming a bit more uncomfortable. But still within some sort of comfortability limits, okay? So it gets to a point when it, water does start to get to the boiling point, the frog is like, the brain's still working, still cognitive, it's time to leave, get out of here. But then, you can't, you cannot jump out, because the organs have been cooked, okay? So this is the analogy for our companies, okay? Things are changing, you can see the alarm bells, the trends, whether it be climate change, resource scarcity, like uh, water, okay, energy, it could be social indicators like protest, okay, or, or indictments for corruption of 
uh, corporate leaders or political leaders, <coughs> uh, collapses of buildings, all of these things are telling us, okay, it's time. But will we miss the window of opportunity to actually transform our companies, to turn those challenges into the opportunities for business in the 21st century, and to lead change globally in sustainability? That's the big question. So this is basically our trajectory right now. Uh, this is a, definitely a simulated model showing, you know, basically our practices and where it's leading us. We've hit, or almost have hit a tipping point, okay? And when you hit a tipping point, it's system collapse. There is a point, what we call overshoot, where you can go beyond limits because of the complexity of the Earth system to absorb going beyond. It's like you can spend more on your credit card than you make for a while, right? But you can't keep doing that, okay? So I think what this talk is about, and what I really want to encourage everyone, is how we can work as change leaders within our organizations to intercept that no hope graph and turn it into a hope graph, okay? by changing the way we do business, changing our technologies and practices so that we can basically intercept, push the transformation point higher. Because if we wait too long, it's going to be too late. Okay. And one thing to emphasize, that it's not about, and, and we should be very careful about stressing the doom and gloom side. Actually what we should be emphasizing is the possibilities, right? It's about the opportunities. And it can be the time of our life. And that's really what, whether we're talking with kids and youth, our business leaders, that's what they want to hear, okay? And this is something what we call Cassandra's Dilemma. And uh, my mentor and the president of Ackerson Group, which I'm associated with, Alan Ackerson, He's also an author, and he had written a book called Believing Cassandra quite a number of years ago. But it was the book that changed me, and I think changed a lot of people. And the, the subtitle is An Optimist View at a Pessimist World. Okay? Because uh, Cassandra is a, the Greek god, goddess, right? And she had, was cursed. She was uh, abducted by Apollo. Um, he wanted to marry her, wanted her to love him. She wouldn't. So eventually he said, okay, I'll let you go. You have to kiss me. And when uh, she kissed him, there was a curse. So that whenever she, she could see the future, no one would believe her. That was the curse. As she warned the, the Greeks about the Trojan horse. That actually, the, the, you know, um, the enemy is inside the horse. But because of the curse, no one believed her. So that's our dilemma. If you make a prediction that warns of future catastrophe, and nobody believes you, then it happens, then you're right but you've also failed as a change agent, okay? Or if you make a prediction that the world's going to, to collapse, and people do act in time, then you've succeeded, but people perceive you as being totally wrong, okay? So our solution is really to work for a system transformation based on a positive vision of the future, a positive message, okay? Sustainability is not environmentalism not environmentalism with a new name. Environmentalism classically, and not to be harsh on it, but it's classically been about no, okay? Whereas sustainability is how can we maybe do it in a different way, not no, right? So that's the big point of departure, right? So what is the role of being a change agent? leading change, and that's the key. As I started out with, I think a lot of people who are passionate, and that's probably the main characteristic, you have to be passionate about this. You have to believe in it. My life uh, in companies would be middle managers, younger people in the organization. You might have some power, but not the ultimate controller power in the company. And of course you need to be able to influence higher up, and that's where the strategy comes in. 
how do we need that change? Okay. So um, we have to have certain qualities, and we have to have uh, strategies, tactics. We want our companies to be good. We want our companies to lead that change, as well as making a profit, because that's what business is about. Okay. Making a profit, whether it's your products or your services. And that often means also, if we're going to adopt sustainability, transforming how we make decisions, the government, governance um, system. Okay, so we are these people trying to promote, get influence, get other people to join our team. This is what this talk is about, really. So, if we're looking about a corporation, it's really about behavior and mindset, values, assumptions, okay, worldviews. Now, if you try to go to the CEO, and you know, CEO is most likely going to have a very similar worldview as the corporate culture, right? And you're in there saying we need to change. Of course, they're going to be quite skeptical, <laughs> because if you say why did they're going to be mostly like, okay, it's worked for us now. Why do we need to change? Change means that we're wrong, right? Because it's basically, if, if you want to change if you're not doing well, right? Something right. So you can you're going to face you're going to bump up against a lot of skepticism. Okay? So where do you start? I think the before you can start to affect the, the mindset the norms, the values, the assumptions. You really have to start changing behaviors first, okay? But that's not the ultimate. Oftentimes, in education, they think that's the ultimate. You change behavior. But I see it in my research in Indonesia. They want kids to, in schools, to have the habit of not throwing down waste, um, separating the waste, everything. But actually, when the waste goes leaves the school, it's all mixed back together and goes to the landfill. So you've got a habit, but actually, there's no belief. Okay. So, but that's the first point. Okay. And the best way to change behavior is to change something in the system. Because if we try to make behavior change without changing the system, it's never going to work. Systems generate a behavior response. Right now in Bangkok, and I, I believe it's still true, recycling, to run a recycling business in, this, in the BMA is illegal. Okay, I believe that's true. And all recycling is done. You can pick up, you know, you have the three-wheel salang. You drive around, honk their horn, ring their bell, and you say, you sell your recyclables, right? Very informally. But I believe all the recycling distribution centers are outside the city limits, okay? Because of the perception that it's unclean and unhygienic and probably other reasons. So there's not really a formal recycling system in Bangkok, okay? So how much gets recycled here? Anyone know? What percent of our waste? I think a lot. Everybody buys and sells, right? So I mean, I think this is a country where I saw the city, which I think the recycling is quite high. Uh, it's the, just my belief. Yeah, it's just your belief. But well, probably you think because you see a lot of these recyclers, right? Yeah, a lot. Yeah. But it's sixteen percent from World Bank last research I saw. Oh. Sixteen okay. percent of the waste. And like uh, recently I've been working with Phuket and we tend to forget about other types of waste, like organic waste. And like Phuket has an incinerator and a lot of waste going to the incinerator because they don't have any landfill space. But 50% of that waste is wet organics. Okay? So it's just not e efficient to burn wet organic to make energy. You're losing money. <laughs> you know, you're wasting it. Okay. So, as compared to other cities like in the US or Japan, what is the percentage? 
I don't know Japan, but like Taipei, I believe it's somewhere around 80% is recycled. Because they have a, a law, a system change, right? Like you, are, you have a clear plastic bag, you have to use the bag that the government provides. It's clear, all right? They have curbside uh, recycling, and you are given a maximum limit of kilos per household per week. If you over that, they, they bill you, okay? You are basically you pay a premium, premium price for your garbage. So that's an incentive, right? So that's a system change. It created a system that creates a behavior response. You don't have that system here. So you might have the intention of recycling, but mm, okay, sometime, but most time, no. I don't have time, I'm too busy. But if there was something similar to Taipei, you would make that time, okay? So that's the main point. Um, there are some steps in sustainability change process. Step one is basically we have to wake up and decide. Okay. I think the reason that you're here, even if you're not working in CSR or sustainability, you're interested in this topic. Okay. You think it's relevant. Maybe because you've seen it a lot in the media. Okay. And that's one way to wake up and decide. The media starts connecting the dots. And it kind of like resonates with us. Oh, this is important. Or it could be that really epiphany moment. Okay. That, uh, that I have to do something. Maybe it's affected me personally, like flooding, you know, the great flood we had here two years ago. Maybe that woke you up to this issue of climate change, okay, but we have to wake up. Maybe for a company, it's a disruption in the supply chain. No water, like what happened in uh, Mataput three or four years ago, when there wasn't enough water for the community and the factories. So the government had to come down and say, you have to decrease production by 40% every factory in Mataput. So obviously, that wake people up. Okay? Water scarcity, water management is a big issue. Okay? Second step is that you have to inspire a shared vision. Okay? You have to build a vision of this future. But you have to build it with others. Okay? And one of the questions, obviously, is how do we do that? Easier said than done. And I'll get into that a bit further in this talk. But the key on the shared vision is that it's basically, before we start a journey, you have to know what you want. Okay? And when you're dealing with a company with different departments, and as we know a lot of departments don't communicate well, they have different priorities, even though we're all working towards profit for our company, right? But our objectives, um, the stress, the parameters that we work on under are different. Okay? We also come from different perspectives. I'm an environmental management system person. I'm worried about our water uh, quality compliance. But if I'm in HR, I'm worried about something else. Okay? Well-being well of employees, competency of the employees. Okay? The key for shared vision is to bring, build a platform to bring those people together but also to have them share what they would like the future to be. Then to really draw linkages between the similarities. Do not start with the differences. Start with what we all share similarly. Then you have a platform that everyone can agree to work. You can also tackle those differences looking at where we can include and synergize differences using maybe a systems approach. How do the differences in future vision actually relate in a cause-effect way? Okay, so that's basically what we're talking about in shared vision. Anyone have any questions so far? No? Okay. And with the, starting out with a shared vision is a method we would call backcasting. Okay, is opposed to forecasting which is more an adaptive model, right? You see, okay, this is where the trends are going and we're going to adapt to things that come up, okay? It's a bit reactionary. Whereas backcasting is having a clear picture of what you want in the future and then coming back to the present 
understanding the situation. Where are we in relation to that future vision? And, the, and basically making your strategy towards what you want, not adapting to what is happening. Okay? So we invent the future, in a sense. But of course, it doesn't mean we don't look at the trends. And that's what you can see coming back. We come back here and we build a baseline. Well, where are we now in relation to where we want to go? And through that, we can build awareness within our teams and our company by developing indicators, new indicators, okay? building sustainability teams. Because a sustainability framework is going to need indicators from all the departments, because we're talking social, economic, environment, right? Human well-being, employee well-being. Okay, and that's really step three: assess the current realities. Right. Um, one another good way to do this is: Have any of you done force field analysis? Let's say we have our vision, uh, and let's say we have our vision and our current reality. So what, that's your kind of middle line. What you would look like and look for in a force field is what are the things that are hindering our ability to achieve this vision, and what are the things that are helping? And looking for the actually identified things within both internal to our company and external. What are things that are hindering, and what are things that are helping? Because this is really key to finding the next point, which is the developing the strategies. We want to find the points of leverage. Okay? Leverage points. Places that we can leverage change in that system. A lever might be a tool, right? But if you use the tool at the wrong place, then it's ineffective. So when I say leverage point, leverage point is the place that you're going to introduce your maybe new idea, your innovation. Okay, so that it is effective, isn't wasted. For us as change leaders, you know, what we have is we have our circle of control, which might be my job responsibility within my department. And then we have a circle of influence that goes beyond my control. Maybe the people I hang out with in the company, okay, uh, some of the committees are, uh, that I might sit on, or teams that I'm with, okay? What we have to identify again is these leverage points that we can start to influence change. And we can only influence change in our circle of influence. But our, in a sense, our vision lies outside of our circle of influence. The key executives who make those decisions are outside, but they're within our level, our circle of concern. We know as change agents, we must affect them, okay? So our work is how do we increase our circle of influence. That's the key for a successful change agent. How do I keep expanding my circle of influence? And this comes down to strategy. One of the ways, step five, is that we have to build a case, a business case for sustainability. We have to link it to what the mission and goals of the company are is making a profit. Okay? It's also market share, it's shared value, okay? it's reputation. So we have to build the case how this sustainability of CSR is going to basically enhance those things, make us more competitive, but not in the short term, but in the long term. What's going to differentiate us? And uh, step six is to mobilize the commitment. Okay. How do we build these teams of influencers? And then last is embed in the line. So all of these require skills for us as change leaders. And what do we have to do? What competency do I need to have? Who do I need to be talking to? And how do I talk to them? So you'll, you'll get this handout, or this, I think there's a PDF, right? The slideshow. So you'll have more slides than what I'm presenting um, because of the length of time. But I'll go, basically, they describe more detail what I'm just going to talk. 
So the first thing for us as a change leader is we need to get credible, okay? And we need to stay credible. So we need to know exactly, we need to have the right information, okay? We need to be reading a lot, we need to reflect, we need to learn, uh, we need to listen, okay? And we need to model, right? We also need to understand our business. It's not just understanding sustainability or CSR, but also understanding how what is happening in business right now. Because no one is going to listen to us if we're just speaking off the cuff, we don't have evidence, we don't have examples to give. Okay? Then they say, oh, you're the green nut in our company, right? So you, you need to be credible. One, with your competency, but also with your information. Second is dialogue. Dialogue is really a balance between what we call advocacy and inquiry. Your boss or the CEO, you're not going to go and tell them what the company needs to do. Okay? People won't listen to you saying, oh, you need to do this. And you're you're outside your sphere of influence, okay? They're not going to listen to you. What we need to do is to facilitate dialogue, which is this balance. And that starts first with inquiry. Well, what do you think? Okay? So you ask questions, you listen. Then you can start to possibly advocate. Well, what do you think about this idea? So offer solutions. Okay, but the first step is inquiry. Right? People want to, you to ask them what they think. Okay? Then you can start proposing solutions, which might be actually linked to what they already, now that you know what they think. So you can use the information you receive from, from uh, the others that you're trying to influence to help you build your case. The dialogue, the balance between advocacy and inquiry. Third is collaborate, educate, and network. Oftentimes, the companies that we have worked with, the Atkinson Group, um, at the beginning, they will have one person who's the CSR manager, uh, the sustainability coordinator, something like that. They have full responsibility, often in these organizations, to implement CSR, our sustainability. But it's a whole organizational type of entity. And because of the diversity of sustainability, we're not talking just environmental compliance. We are talking about making profit for the long term. We're talking about innovation of new products and services. Okay, we're talking about core business functions, right? We're talking about how we communicate with external parties. All of these things. So we need to think about building sustainability teams. And that's what really at Atkinson Group, we require when we take on a client that we're not going, we're not the consultant that's here to offer you strategies. We're really more about process, which doesn't always win us work because our process can be a bit long as we build a sustainability team, okay? The second part of this one, though, is educate. We need to convince the people within our company to go to seminars, to read the books, that our employees do need training, whether they're on the factory floor or they're in the boardroom, that they need to understand these current topics. So education is key, and networking. Networking within departments, networking with customers, networking with the government, with NGOs, basically what we call stakeholder engagement. Okay. Fourth, we need to know how to meet them where they are. And when I say them, is the other people in our company. Sales management. How can sustainability increase revenue? So we need to be able to talk their talk, their language, or if it's the Production manager. We're not going to talk about image. What we're going to talk about is efficiency. Right? How can we ensure steady supply of raw materials? How can we increase uh, production but decrease 
uh, energy use. So we talk their language. If it's HR, we talk about image, reputation. So we have to meet them where they're coming from. Very important. Fifth, understand that people don't like to start over, especially in companies that are busy, busy, busy. And they've adopted models. Oftentimes, they wait until they know that this model is proven. And there's a lot of other of our competitors or people in our sector that have adopted this model. It might be Six Sigma, it might be Balanced Scorecard, it might be Lean Production, it might be uh, doing ISO 14,000, 9,000 accreditation. Whatever it is, that's our departure point. Many times, we need to, we don't want to try to sell sustainability as a new framework, a new model. It's going to be very difficult. It's going to be easier if we try to piggyback our link to existing things that our companies are already doing. Okay. And there's lots of resources and materials that already people are doing this. You can look at balanced scorecards, sustainability balanced scorecard, if you Google it. You'll see there's a lot of research and models in this regard. It's the same with Six Sigma. Okay. Six, influence the influencers. So there are people within any organization um, who have more influence than us. They uh, can say yes or no toward a new idea. They're not the boss, but they can be the steps to the boss. We, we call them the transformer. Okay? They transform our idea into innovation. Because an idea is not an innovation if it's not being used. That's the whole attribute of an innovation. It's being put into practice. It's something new. But we need the right people to say yes, we will adopt this, we will try it out, okay? To eventually get and influence the people in the senior manager. But if I'm middle manager, I can't just knock on the door to the executive and say, we ought to do this, I have a great idea. But if we start to influence the influencers, pull them in our circle, we'll have a better chance. Seven is practice planful opportunism. It means be ready. Have your teams built, have your plans there, have all your ducks lined up, but be mindful of timing. In some sense, timing is everything. If you play your hand and it's not the right time because you're, you know, I don't know for what reason, maybe the direction of the management is toward another crisis. And you say, well, right during the crisis, we should be doing sustainability. Not a good time. Maybe probably after the crisis when things have settled down and it's time for reflection. And that might be the best timing. So timing is very key. Okay. But so I mean, be ready. Have your plan, have your strategies worked out, have your networks built, have people's um, competency, capacity built, then it will be very easy. So plan planful opportunism. Okay, and with that said, um, or before I go for this last part, which is very quick, any questions or any comments from your own experience? Yes. You have service. Yeah. You mean for leadership practice or before? Yeah. I think it's included in almost a lot of the steps. Culture vision is uh, is going to include culture, right? Right. You're not going to build a vision that's contrary to your corporate values and beliefs. Okay, but a vision is not set in concrete, is it? It's a working thing. Okay, so that must be well known. Our vision is something that will evolve, but we need to have a clear destination in mind, knowing that it will possibly change. Like I said, what we want to change first 
possibly is the behavior first. But knowing in long term planning that we want to change the value, belief, and mindset to align with sustainability. So the vision part is definitely the thing with the culture. Um, I, I really believe all the steps. You assess your current realities. Okay? Part of that is the cultural side of your company. How do people think? How do people work? What are relationships between uh, different units in our organization? Okay. Um, building the case for sustainability. When you think about uh, sustainability being a new idea, right? One of the most painful things to human beings is an idea. Because it has the potential to just basically discredit or make void everything that we built our, our position around, our life around. So we have to be very careful in introducing a new idea. So the, through research, um, what we call diffusion innovation research, led by a guy named Everett Rogers, he's identified five key attributes of successful innovations, new ideas. One is observability. Okay, well actually I'll back up. The first one is perceived advantage. If the people you want to adopt, can, you can show that it's going to be better than our current way then they'll be more apt to listen to you, okay? Second is uh, uh, simplicity. You don't want to be like dumb and super simple, but when you're introducing a new idea, people have to understand it easily. And it needs to be implemented simply. It cannot be like complex buttons, whistles, and everything at the beginning. If you think of the mobile phone, you know, 15 years ago when I came here, Nokia had the market share. It's a very simple phone to use, because most people just entered into the technology age, especially migrant workers who come into Bangkok, right? But now, everyone wants everything on their phone. And Nokia has fallen away. Now they don't even exist, right, anymore? They were bought by Microsoft, right? <laughs> yeah. So you see the change, because everyone else now wants, because the innovation has been adopted as the norm, sophistication to income. But at the beginning, no. And that's also understanding culture. Okay? Compatibility. Research has shown it must be compatible, any new idea, with the needs of that target audience and their values. You're not going to introduce uh, bikinis in Afghanistan, right? <laughs> not going to work. Maybe why did the mobile phone take off, the handphone take off, sooner in Asia than it did in North America? Because when I came to, to Thailand, I never had even owned a mobile phone, touched a mobile phone. There were any circle of friends in 97 that owned a mobile phone. I showed them Bangkok, everyone has it. Because one needs. Americans all have landlines in their homes. Okay, it wasn't a big need at that time. All right? But in, in Asia, people didn't really have it so much. Okay, so what were the other two? Trial ability. Very important that you can pilot a new idea in one part of the company uh, so that people can ching ching gong. Ching ching gong in Tangwatch, man. Kaja Aroy to him one. And the last one is observability. You have to be able to show that there is a difference there. Like real, tangible, you can show something. So I think all of that is really about culture. Well, I think incentives always help, okay, before and uh, after. But we have to also, how do you say, um, we have to be continuous. We can, and we have to walk the talk. And for leadership, that's very crucial, right? Uh, if you're not, you're telling people to do something, but we don't do it, then people, you lose credibility fast. I mean, you think of, in the sustainability world, and reporting HSBC standard standard charter very high in the top 10 Fortune 500 companies for and BP also for sustainability reporting. Now look what Deep Horizon BP their credibility and sustainability is shot. Okay, standard charter what they got uh, 1.7 million dollar a billion dollar fine for money laundering and and, and working you know basically. 
some evidence shows that they were laundering narco traffic money from Mexico and also dealing with against the sanctions in Iran. Whether you believe that the sanctions for Iran are, are good or bad, as a corporate entity, you have to follow the law. Okay. So now they go from the top tier of sustainability companies. Everyone lose credibility. Okay. Yes. Build the case. For you, because we're really talking about how do we lead change, okay, yourself. So if you're by yourself, or hopefully you're collaborating, you're building a team. You need case studies, okay? Case studies of within our sector that show how companies are taking these challenges and turning them into opportunities, okay? Example, um, Interface Flooring, a very big global carpet company. Okay, they have a factory here in Thailand. They're a private company, American company, based in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, about, about 15 years ago or so, they were like any normal company selling carpets. Okay, uh, roll carpets to mostly office buildings, hotels, big customer clients like that, okay? Um, Ray Anderson, the head of the company, had one of these arrow in the heart moments, step one. Woke up, basically, and I'll get to this in a minute. His environmental manager said, Ray, we're, have, um, we're organizing a conference on environmental management, and we would like you to be the keynote speaker. Ray's like, he's the president of the company, he's like, I don't know anything about environment. He said, please just be our keynote speaker. And Ray's like, I need to prepare. So the environment manager gave him a book called Natural Capitalism by Paul Hawkins, talking about how sustainability and protecting the planet makes business sense. Okay? Ray Anderson read this book, and it was like, our, com our company is a vapid raping and pillagers of the world. I don't want my company to be this. Something in that book resonated with him. Okay? Now, after this event and the, his speech, he basically had some time to reflect, went back to his managers and said, I want to rebuild our company. I want to change the whole business model to align with sustainability. Why do we sell carpets? Where do those carpets end up? Do hotels really want to own a carpet? Does a university or office really want to own a carpet? What are we supplying? Carpets? Can we supply flooring services rather than carpets? So they changed their model from selling carpets to selling flooring services. Now they're called interface flooring. So you sign a lease, they will come deliver your carpet, but you don't own it. You sign a service contract, guaranteed that carpet will be recycled back by the company. And they now have grown uh, exponentially in business. Okay? I think they are somewhere in the like 65 countries now, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And they the innovation has come. Um, they now use carpet tiles because one way they have to even if it makes common sense to talk to your client, your that hotel and say you know, you don't really want to own a carpet. But the norm is, yeah, I do want to own a carpet. That's, we've always done it this way. No, you should just lease our service. We'll take care of everything. How do I convince you? Where do carpets, oftentimes you'll see carpets that have been in hotels or offices, they look really grungy, right? But mostly just in the high traffic areas, right? People walking a lot or spilled next to the water cooler or the coffee machine, there's stains. Right? When you cut that carpet out to replace it, it looks even worse sometimes, right? So what they did, they worked with his design team to create really wild mosaics, patterns that you can take any tile out and wouldn't interrupt the visual aesthetics of the carpet. And by using tiles, it's not a roll. So what you can do, convincing the business, your client, is 
if you're going to take that role, you're going to have to stop all operations for a day, two days, to take all that carpet up, right? But if it's just tiles, you can take out just that tile in the high, um, high what do you call it, activity area, without disrupting your business. Oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> okay, that's the business case. Okay, and there's lots collaboration. Uh, HP some years back, um, the EU came out and said that uh, this was probably in 2004, 2003, 2004, that all um, companies in the EU had to uh, recycle their post-production waste. Okay, up to at least 80 percent, I think was the standard. So they started producing all these platforms, uh, basically centers to take recycling waste. The price is very high. So HP, thinking out of the box, said, hmm, um, can we talk to our competitors, not really competitors, but people in our sector like Braun, Electrolux, other companies that have electronic post-production waste like ours, can we talk to them and see if we can collaborate and maybe we can develop our own business unit between the four companies, co-investing, that will be cheaper than the EU's price. Okay? And exactly what they did. They set up their own recycling centers. Their co-owners basically set up a, a, a whole entire new business. Right? That other companies now, because the price is much more competitive, would go and recycle. So they took that challenge and turned it into an opportunity for a whole new business. GE is saying with equal imagination. They just basically built a whole business unit that's I think worth like 35 billion now to deliver products and services that address sustainability issues, whether it's water filtration or efficiency lighting, appliances, that sort of thing. So having those cases to be able to talk is what you want. Yeah. So I just wanted to get your thoughts, uh, kind of thinking back on uh, building the case for change, especially with um, companies that don't have an overarching vision for sustainability, which is the majority. They yeah. maybe just want to experiment. And in, in my experience, one thing that I saw happen a lot is as a consultant working and trying to help them adopt sustainability, energy efficiency, climate change projects, we work with the sustainability director or facilities manager, and they would say that they want help from us to help make the business case because they're gonna have to go to their CFO who's got 20 different projects he's, he or she is trying to prioritize. Yeah. And yet, with a lot of sustainability projects, a lot of their value is intangible. And, and they would often say, well, if this project doesn't meet our hurdle rate, and it could be a climate change project, we won't adopt it, it won't even make our first cut. Yeah. But there's something odd about that because a lot of sustainability is taking these externalities and trying to put them back into the price. So how do you handle that for a company that doesn't have that full overarching strategy that they want to take a project by project approach, yeah. but it doesn't hit that hurdle rate and they have to find a way to... I, mean, I think one of the classic ways is life cycle analysis, right? Let's see it looking at from the upstream to the downstream. What are the, the inputs and outputs in terms of expenses, revenue, impacts? So that's one, I think the one method that's been used uh, quite a lot in the past. The, another, I think, um, way that we are doing is using some of the tools that we developed. One is called the Compass. The sustainability compass. So we work with companies to build using, rather than the triple bottom line, we basically have used this analogy of reorienting, a tool for reorienting the company. Okay, so they don't have a vision yet, but they know they want to start to address this. So we're using that to build indicators, baseline indicators with them that are um, one more representative of the 360 degree um, characteristic of the uh, situation of the company. But the second is that we take a systems approach. Okay, 
when you actually, because the indicators tell us what's happening, but they often don't answer the question, why is it happening? Okay, so that also helps, I think, with tying in the externalities to what we care about internally. Okay, and so when we see how things link in a cause and effect way, where are the feedback loops? Okay, how do things um, reinforce each other? And that sometimes turns on the light. And that's an approach that we use every time. Is we do take an assistance approach. So I don't know if that provides some answer to your question. Okay, so just quickly, uh, we use to help change agents, leaders need tools. They have passion, they can, um, communication is also very important. They have the soft skills, but they also need just a toolkit. Okay, you know, like a toolbox. Sometimes you just need a screwdriver, sometimes you need a whole assortment of tools. So, the, what we call the accelerator. And the reason we call it accelerator is because we, these are the tools we use to engage people at all levels very quickly and to try to produce action and results very quickly. Okay, so we try to accelerate change but also mainstream it. Make it not just uh, the ownership of the, the people who are the technology masters or the sustainability masters, but that everyone in the company can participate. Okay? And they, it might look simple, like we have this other tool called Pyramid. But what it is is using the compass as the base using what we call the ISIS method, which is a sequence of steps. Indicators, where are we? Okay, what's the situation now? Putting those indicators into a systems analysis to answer the question, why are they showing the data that they do? What's the relationship? But again, from four compass points. Okay, so it's integrated. You got economy, you have nature, North, you have uh, society south, and you have west well-being. Okay, so we use a system approach to identify feedback loops because that's the key to sustainability. If it's linear, how do you sustain it? If you only, only understand cause and effect in a linear way, how do you sustain it? Right? You have to identify feedback loops because that's the self-sustaining element. Because you don't want to keep putting money, energy into change. You want it to build a mechanism that it keeps reinforcing. So within the system, we try to identify those key leverage points that will sustain change. That leads us to innovation. What is the new idea that we would introduce and can carry out at that leverage point based on a system understanding? And then we develop strategy. A lot of time, the strategy we're developing is not the strategic plan so much. It's more of, how do you say it, the fusion strategy. Our team has come up with a great idea. We've used the system process. But how do we convince others to buy into our idea? Okay, that's the strategy I'm talking about. And we actually have an equation we call the Gilman's equation. N minus O must be greater than CC. Means in means the value, perceived value people have of your new idea. Minus O, the perceived value people have of the old way, the current way that you're trying to replace. That difference, so the perceived value of the new way must be greater than this, the old way, but it has to be greater than the CC. And CC stands for the cost of change. Perceived cost of change. Have you ever gone to anyone, your spouse, your friend, your coworker, your boss, and say, I have this idea, we should do this. And they say, oh, that's a good idea, but. Whatever comes after the but is usually the perceived cost of change. We don't have time right now to do that. We don't have a budget. Uh, our department doesn't have that sort of competency. So we have to think about how do we reduce, as in our strategy, how do we boost the value of our new idea in relation to the old way. And how do we reduce the perceived cost of change? Okay, it's very key. It's just, it's social marketing, basically. Okay, 
So, and then we have a tool called the Amoeba, which is really about looking at your organization like an Amoeba, with different parts. An Amoeba has a pseudo foot that moves toward food. We're using the, that analogy to say that a new idea, like sustainability, or CSR, is coming from outside your corporate culture. And again, we're talking culture here, right? You have a few people in your company say, oh yeah, I really like sustainability. We should go there. But the mainstream is slow. It's in the nucleus of the amoeba, right? Don't want to go anywhere. So you send out the pseudofoot. Let's go explore this idea, a few of us. Maybe it's only you. But you need more people, okay? So basically, you're in the pseudofoot. This is the mainstream. They're not going to move until someone else tells them to move or there's momentum, right? There's also people maybe in your company that are resistors, reactionaries. Not that they're bad, but they don't feel that your idea is useful. Right? Our company is doing quite well. We don't need to change. Okay? So what is key? For change agents, I talked about the influencers. We call them transformers. They sit on the kind of the, the boundary between mainstream and change. They're respected, but uh, they have decision-making power, they legitimize an idea, but they're not going to take risk unless you can build the business case or the case for it. Okay? You have to have all your ducks lined up, but they're the key people that will influence the mainstream. Okay, so change agents are over here, we're promoting the idea. You need to identify the transformers and bring them into our circle of influence. Help support them with, with case studies, like you said, as a consultant, right? All right, our job is to research, find cases that link to your business model, right, your products. And then they have that ammunition, which then they can go and influence someone else, okay? Um, also within this, you have laggers. You, every organization, not every, but I've met a few have people that are curmudgeons. You know what a curmudgeon is? It's like the sourpuss, you know? It's like a cynical person. Why we have this in our model? Because sometimes a change agent, when you talk to a curmudgeon, they sound like a change agent at the beginning. Been there, done that, but they'll shoot down every idea. They'll make you say, oh, it's actually not worth doing. They're not against your idea, they're against everything. <laughs> And if you look back in their history, usually they're a bit older. They've been in the company or have been in the sector for a while. They were probably a change agent that didn't, wasn't successful. Okay? Laggard is the same. We just need to know who was a laggard sometimes. We actually use this tool for mapping change within our, an organization, helping our clients who want to make change, who would play what role. Okay? And every, and no one has that role every time in life. Sometimes we might be change agents, sometimes we're mainstream, it might be a reaction, it depends on the idea. Okay, last tool is we have the stratosphere here, which is really a strategic planning tool. Okay, and uh, my last slide. Some of the other secret secrets of leading change, the power of invitation. A very, how do you say, um, not talked about, but very powerful secret. Invite people. Invite your CEO. Invite your boss to a seminar, a luncheon like this. This is when the light might go off. Give them a book. Okay? Something, the power of invitation can be quite strong. Okay? Second, volunteering. When people see that you volunteer without any, like, really, I wouldn't say monetary or, you know, that sort of thinking of, I'm going to get this back. But just volunteering and giving, you become credible. Okay? Third, you need to facilitate the process. Okay? Very important. You can't just be, okay, let's go this way. You know, I feel passionate about this. I have lots of information. But you're not being able to like, coordinate the different people you want to involve. So facilitation skill is a very important um, secret of change agency. We talked about simplification, right? We don't want it to be dumb, but we understand that, that things have to be simply implemented. So 
especially in busy organizations. We need to think out of the box. We need to be innovative, creative. We need to think differently. We're not talking about, for sustainability, it's not talking really so much about incremental change. Sometimes we do that, but long term, we need to think about radical change. That requires that we are creative. Patience. <laughs> Determine things are not going to happen always fast. This is where it comes back to that, that skill of planful opportunism. Okay? Be ready. Be patient. Don't overplay at the wrong time. Okay? It's like playing the game strategy. Right? And last, change should never be about you. It should always be about the change, the movement. If people have a sense that it's about you, it's about your ego, it's about your own power relations with other people, then you're going to fail. They're going to pull out. It can never be about you. It has to be about the movement. Okay, so that's it. It's over 20 minutes. This is Ackerson Group, where we have affiliates and associates all over the place. Um, I, in January, if you have the time, uh, we are having a five-day masterclass. Um, Alex our, um, Axel, one of our cohorts in Germany, who's an expert and consultant on, on leadership, especially internal leadership, and Alan Ackerson, who's basically the mentor and the inventor of all of these tools that we use. They will be here along with myself at Sassen working at Sassen for a five day master class. So you don't have to be like advanced advanced, but it's it's not like basic, basic level. Okay? We basically want you to be uh, have personal mastery when you walk out of the five days. Okay. And then we also I uh, encourage you to check out our website, Pyramid2030. Um, it's a volunteer process, it doesn't cost anything. You can download the uh, basic tools, the pyramid tool, the, the guide, and you can run your own pyramid workshop. Dennis has done one last year, right? Yeah. And so what we're trying to do is that we're trying to influence the sustainable development goals that are being developed by the UN right now. Right now they're in working groups. Because we're transitioning from the MDGs, Millennium Development Goals, to now SDGs, okay, Sustainable Development Goals. That's what came out of Rio Plus 20 meeting. Because the, the criticism of the MDGs, they still apply, was they were handed down by the developed world to the developing world. You have to meet these benchmarks. These are your goals. But they didn't really apply to the industrialized countries. So SDGs apply to everyone, <laughs> right? Sustainable Development Goals. So Alan sits on the EU Presidential Commission for uh, Sustainable Development for the EU. And so he's actually quite an influencer on the SDGs. So we're, we set up this campaign to try to get people to engage with their own peer groups, their own communities, their own teams, build these pyramids, send us a report, and and put it on the website, and then we'll try to, at the end, we're going to produce a whole report that will go to try to at least have some in voice in this SDG process. Thank you very much. crucial for getting, getting them to really buy into it and it doesn't just become a marketing yeah. ploy or, or activity. But if they start just as a marketing ploy activity, yes. do you find companies then actually have the inspiration the, and then the, the steps you sort of you know, No, my, not always. My own experience when I we first started working, you know, my first big project was in 2006 in Indonesia. So we had a big mining company. Ancom, we had Textile, we had a pulp and paper company, we had Indonesia Power as a client, 
and all of them wanted to do this. But we had some seed funding. They weren't really into it. That sort of got them on board. Okay? So we had some seed funding. They just did a matching. So it wasn't so big investment for them. What we learned, though, is that we started, we built these teams. So as I said, we worked for about six to seven months with each company, building a team of about 25 from all the different departments based on the compass. So we used the compass to actually identify the different team members from the company. Okay? Middle managers, really passionate people, you know, some have been working on sustainability through LEAD, Lead International, which is Leadership in Environment and Development. As fellows, okay. Others had no idea, but they were identified as leaders within the company. What we learned by just engaging with them first, we went through this whole process, built great ideas, initiatives from them, okay, from their building of their competency, their understanding using a system approach. They came up with ideas for initiating change in their company. All of them were shot down. Why? Because we didn't get the top on board at the very beginning of the process. So we learned our lesson. So at least what we have learned is that we have to sit down, do an executive, what we call uh, executive seminar, introduce them to the tools, and then do a visioning process with them. At least get them to say, this is where we see our company, these are our values, okay? We show them trends, and they have to react to that and say, this is what we would like our company to be like, and we support. And the values, we get them to make sure that they can see how their values link to sustainability. So that was the turning point where things actually were implemented. So one of our biggest successes, uh, Bank Negara Indonesia, b &E. So they did it again as a sort of a PR exercise. They wanted to sort of, but they had some incentive. They were losing ground their other state banks. And they wanted to differentiate themselves to become the green bank. Okay, so that was their incentive to develop some green lending products, something that they could call themselves green. But after the end of the project, they actually created a whole sustainability division as a result of the project. Is that like didn't their business case came first? And then in a sense, saw, in a sense, I mean, they needed to differentiate themselves. Yeah. yeah. And after that, they saw that wherever the inspiration came after. Well, we started with the board. Like, after they said, yes, we want to be on board, and we had the team selected, because they already had like a, for the whole company, it's like 22,000 employees, but they had selected 70 individuals who were like leaders. So we able to do a sort of a vetting process, and we got 25 of those from the different um, departments, okay? Um, but they really didn't have any idea what sustainability was. But we did learn our lesson that we did a seminar, we did a visioning exercise with the top board, to make sure they were on board. Because it was so disillusioning, we worked so hard, six months, with these teams, and they said, no, we're not gonna do this, you know? Because <laughs> they hadn't bought into it at the beginning. We had entered in with the passionate people, but didn't really um, pull in the top management get there to do some things and, and align them. a lot of times sustainability has really leaned toward the efficiency. Okay, this is how much money we can save by saving this much energy. Okay, so that's a, that's a low hanger. And it's what we call low hanging fruit. You know, you make your processes more efficient. You can do the same or more with less input, energy or raw material. Of course, it's, 
and much more simpler to show the, the value savings, the fact. But the more intangibles, like uh, employee loyalty, you know, uh, retention, and less turnover, okay, those are a little bit harder to quantify, right? But I think uh, you, you, you still have to build a case, but they're going to definitely be more qualitative in nature. Uh, I go back to a very interesting, and one that I use sometimes, about the, the, the how do you say, the case for doing sustainability, how it affects your whole employee base. Okay, so there's a, you can go on Google and find this story as well. Interface form, where I talked about how they changed their business model from selling carpets to selling flooring services. So now they actually have a mission zero. Their mission zero is by 2020, there will be zero waste company. They'll produce zero waste, okay? Right now they're at 70% of that goal. And you can track that. They have, uh, their goal is called Mount Sustainability. So they have a mountain like, uh, I think it's like Everest, right? And they have like base camps, you know? Camp one, two, and three, and that's their milestones. And you can actually see that on their website, okay? But they're really looking at whole cultural change within all of their employees, if they all understand why we're doing this. So there's a very interesting clip on YouTube that he explains how one time they were doing this training at their factory in Atlanta for other company executives from other businesses to share their experience, right? And he was saying that in this workshop, this training, there was this one woman executive, I don't know what company, but she was really skeptical, critical. She was trying to sabotage and sense the training. She was just like, Ray said, I don't believe this, you know, always asking the critical question. Not that that's bad, but she was just not buying into it, okay? Eventually, she had to go to the restroom during the process. And he was saying that the, because they did their training at the factory, the toilet was across the factory floor. So as she was walking across, and she relayed this back to Ray or his team, she walked across the factory floor, and there was a guy on a forklift with a big roll of flooring going to a machine. And she stopped him, and she said, what do you do here? And his first answer was, ma'am, because this was Atlanta, Georgia, he said, ma'am, my work is to help our company be a leader in saving the world. This is a guy from the forklift. That was his, his, his response. So he said, what do you do here? And that was his response. Okay, she's like, what? What do you mean? <laughs> and so she questioned him further. And I guess this is related from her, or the story from his team that she, when she came back from the toilet. And uh, she had related that. They talked for a while, but eventually he's like, ma'am, I hate to be rude, but there's a machine over there that's running, and it doesn't have a flooring. Uh, this flooring should be on that machine, so it's turning out more emissions than CO2. So I better get the, if you don't mind, I'll get back to work. <laughs> you see, that is full understanding. It's about efficiency, but it's about something greater. Okay, and this was the forklift operator of this company. Okay, so that's an intangible business case. But when you can think about your, uh, your employees, even at the factory floor, having a sense that our company has a greater purpose, you know that, one, there's an increased loyalty. Their values are definitely must, in some way, be aligned with you know, the, your, your corporate values. They really believe, they have bought into it. So I think you're gonna reduce waste, you're gonna reduce corruption, and you're gonna increase productivity. Because they believe in that, okay? Which that means that probably Interface has done a lot in terms of training, educating, building networks within their company so that everyone is influenced by others, by their peers. Okay, well I've held you here a long time. So, thank you very much.
big applause for that. So, I have a symbol of appreciation on her. Oh, a little thing for you, bro. Our speaker. Thank you very much. very much for coming on a rainy day. We really appreciate it. Just uh, some announcement. Um, we have a trip to a fair underwear factory <laughs> on Monday the 28th of October. Um, it's, it's a very interesting little social enterprise. Um, uh, they, they were formerly um, workers, factory workers at Triumph Underwear. And, and uh, they laid off like 2,000 women in 2008 or 2009. And, and a bunch of them got together and, and fought for their rights uh, for a very long time. And they ended up uh, starting this uh, little company that produces um, underwear on Sukhumvit 115. So that's where we're going to go and visit them. It's a factory and shop, and it's very interesting. Uh, unfortunately, I can't be there that day because I'm, I'm going to the US for the big net impact uh, conference. Uh, you're welcome to join me there. Uh, but I won't make it back in time. Kumbra Chidai will be taking us there. We have a van for about 10 passengers, or you can take the BTS to Bering Station and take a cab from, from there. It's a very short ride. So I hope you can join us. And also we have a brochure for the master class outside if you don't have one already. Um, Robert and I are here to answer any questions about the master class in January. We highly recommend it. it it's really fun. Like I, I took it the first time with, with Robert and then with uh, Ellen and Axel uh, in Arizona this year and it's amazing and that's why I've been working really hard to bring them over here. It's not often that they come to Asia. Um, Robert is always in Asia and, and he's their associate uh, for Asia but it's really great to have all three of them um, at the same uh, place for five days. It'll be very intensive. Yeah. D Dennis has done it. You can ask yeah, him. Yeah, I did it in 2009 in Stockholm uh, and uh, I recommend it as well. Yes. Thank you. It's really fun and, and you get a lot to go back with in terms of the, the thinking, the mindset, and, and the change management, you know, how to handle people and also yourself in terms of um, doing what Robert has talked about today, like carrying it out in, in the real world. It's, it's very empowering. So thank you again, and uh, see you next month or on the 28th at Fair Underwear. Thank you. <laughs> also, you get to learn how to run all the tools. Yeah. So you use all the tools. Yeah, it's really